Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another edition of Spring Office Hours. I'm your host, Dan Vega. With me, as always, is Deshaun Carter. Deshaun, how and are you, my friend? I'm wonderful, and I'm here with Scott Rosenberg, our How's good friend. You're, you're in a hey, different I'm location. Fun. Good to be here. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, we always say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, and now this is weird because it's evening. <laughs> it's evening for me. I'm in Tel Aviv. Uh, I didn't know what time it was for you. What time is it currently where you are? 10.30 p.m. All right. That's pretty late. Uh, I'm usually in bed by 10. So, yeah, that's pretty right. late. Right. I like to say that <laughs> nothing good happens after 8 p.m. except for sleep. That's true. So, yeah, about here eight, we are. But yes. <laughs> we are now, showing our age with that. And statement. spring office hours. And spring office hours, right. <laughs> uh, I was telling Scott, uh, you know, we were having dinner. It was the VMware Technology Forum here in Tel Aviv today. Uh, it was a great event. Uh, lots of great questions. It was great conversation with customers. Uh, and yeah, and we had had dinner. And on the way, uh, I was telling them, even though I'm in Tel Aviv, I don't want to miss spring office hours. It is my favorite part of the week. That's awesome. What? Um, so any highlights from the, the event today that you want to share with us? Well, from my perspective, was seeing Deshaun on the main stage, you know, giving the keynote. It was uh, pretty great seeing him and Para together talking about, you know, the vision of Tansu and was pretty awesome. And uh, I had the privilege of also speaking there on some Kubernetes stuff, uh, which awesome. was fun. Um, but just really interesting to see the first real, um, like, it's the first conference of VMware's in Israel where you can see really Tanzu taking a big stage and huge amounts of DevOps engineers coming and developers and not just the traditional IT that were the typical customers. And it's great right. to see the Tanzu story really growing. Yeah, That's awesome. I will say I saw a clip of you on the main stage today, Deshaun. I was going around Twitter. Very impressed. Yeah, you looked. You looked real good. You looked confident up there. I love to see it. So awesome you work. Jazzed. Yeah. I was, I was jazzed. <laughs> cool. So um, what? Uh, things are good. Uh, been busy, real busy. Last week, I put out a f almost four-hour course on getting started with Spring Boot. <laughs> um, so you can imagine a five to ten minute video takes me eh, four to eight hours to put together for YouTube. You can imagine what a four hour video takes. Um, that's why I don't put those out often because it's a lot of work. So, but uh, getting well received. So uh, excited about that. That's great. Um, that and you know, over the weekend I was having a crazy Saturday night. I wrote 
a hello world application in Rust. So I'm pretty much an expert now. So go ahead and you can ask me anything about Rust. Um, pretty cool language. Just wanted to kind of divert and like learn something new that was like completely different. And given all of the stuff that we've been building lately using like Spring Shell and, and building CLIs, Rust is a really great language for if you want to like build CLI apps. I know a lot of people are building CLI apps on top of Rust. So just wanted to see what the hype was about and figured I'd give it a give it a try. So that's that's great. I, I also was getting crazy uh, since this weekend. <laughs> Uh, somebody reached out and they were talking about COBOL. Of course, I'm a big fan of the COBOL build pack. Uh, and I actually took it for a spin. So yeah, you know, sometimes it's, it's nice to get outside of the lane. Uh, yeah. I will call it crazy though. I, I got back, back in my lane real fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know my lane, I know where my strengths are, but sometimes I just like to, to diverge for a few minutes. <laughs> awesome. I also watched that video, Thomas, real good video. Uh, Fireship does an awesome job putting together kind of those 100 second videos of, of, particular topic. So I love that one. Yeah. I'm a fan of their work. <clears throat> um, other than that, we had a three day weekend. That was nice. Well, I did. I don't know about your weekend. <laughs> you were, you were in Colorado last time I talked to you and now you're in Tel Aviv. So I was trying to put the two together there. Yeah. Uh, get home to Kansas city, Colorado to Kansas city, uh, just about 24 hours or just under 24 hours and then head to Tel Aviv. That's awesome. Cool. Well, uh, do you think, will we see, I, so I did see the highlight, like a couple highlights of you talking on the main stage. Will those videos be available at any point? I believe that the videos will be available, not just the keynote, but cool. all of the tracks they had. So we get to see Scott talk too? Yes, you should see awesome. Scott. Too. Yeah, if you cool. understand Hebrew, you'll be able to see my session. <laughs> <laughs> or you can watch the slides in the live demo. Yeah. But there we go. Yeah, the slides were all in English. Uh, I was in the room. I watched. It was it was easy to understand. Uh, so yeah, it'll definitely be worth watching. I, I love this question. What's the topic for today? Is Deshaun still on vacation? Deshaun is permanently on vacation, folks. He's just <laughs> traveling the world. Uh, <laughs> The topic for today is we have our good friend Scott with us, and he's going to help us answer questions. So we're awesome. going to jump into a mailbag, and we're going to answer your questions. So we have some questions that we can get to. Uh, we've been doing this the last couple of weeks, and I know this has been a really fun, fun format for us. But we keep getting more and more questions from you guys. So uh, please go ahead and ask those questions. We'll see if we can't get to them. We have a, I have a couple things that I wanted to talk about. Um, so we'll do that first, and then we'll get into the questions. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen. And let's see. Oh, man. Um, StreamYard wants to change things up on me here. So let me do this. That's OK. While you do that, I'll talk about some of the things that I've heard. Uh, you know, there's this concept of a service mesh uh, and this idea that, hey, I can have a, a global namespace and I can have my apps being accessed from anywhere. Uh, with that comes some interesting challenges uh, and some some really sharp edges uh, that you need to be aware of. And that's kind of where my mind has been uh, coming out of this VMware technology forum here in Tel Aviv. It's like those patterns that are going to go <laughs> along with uh, things like Tanzu Service Mesh and these more advanced deployment models that we're going to be seeing more of in the future. Cool. Um, nice shirt, Dan. I, Jitter Ted, our good friend Ted here, I am wearing this on purpose. I know that Deshaun is part of the committee, the selection committee for KCDC. And I know there are some other folks out there who are on the selection committee and they're still working through these proposals. So I'm doing this a little bit on purpose. I'm trying to flaunt some gear here, maybe get a little uh, sympathy votes my way. So I'm okay with that. I have no pride. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, calendar. So one place we'd like to start is calendar.spring.io. If you're not aware of this, uh, this is a release calendar for spring projects and the entire ecosystem. So you can come in here and check out a grid. You can check out a list of just kind of what's happening. So we are here on Tuesday, February 21st, almost to March. This is great. Um, lots of stuff happening this week, uh, some exciting things. So Spring Authorization Server, we had a couple releases, one of which is 1.0.1. I know some people never like to kind of take 1.0 for a spin. They kind of wait for that one release to get all those little bugs kind of out of the way. So here you are, Spring Authorization Server, big project in our ecosystem. Go ahead and check that out. Um, 
You'll also see Spring GraphQL 1.1.2, one of my favorite projects around, just some, some minor bug fixes there and some upgrades on dependencies. Later this week, we have Spring Boot 3.0.3 coming um, and a Spring Boot 3.1.0 milestone one. So um, some exciting things from Spring Boot, which are going to pick up so that 3.0.3 is picking up from last week's Spring Framework 6.0.5. So again, if you're not sure what's in these releases and you want to go, okay, Dan, uh, Spring Boot 3.0.3 is picking up Spring Framework uh, 6.0.5. What's in there? You can actually just open this up um, and open up in a new tab, and you can take a look at everything that was kind of fixed or completed in this particular version. Uh, so that'll give you a good idea. Also, there's release notes um, for some of these, so go ahead and read through the release notes. Anything kind of sticking out to you there, Deshaun? Uh, no, uh, and primarily because uh, I'm on my laptop and I don't have my glasses on. So oh. I, might have to <laughs> I can't see that. <laughs> All right. Um, I can always bump this up for you, old man, mm -hmm. if that will help. Um, maybe. Uh, um, one other thing I wanted to mention. So the Golden Path to Spring 1. Music, too. The Golden Path to Spring 1. These are a set of presentations from um, leading up to Spring 1, which will be at VMware Explorer this year. There are presentations that you could check out every Tuesday and Thursday. One just happened right before us here uh, on this particular channel. So check out the upcoming episodes. Oh, Thomas Vitale, one of my favorites in two days. Uh, he's going to be talking about Spring Cloud Gateway, which is really exciting. Another favorite of mine, Matt Rabel. Marco Codes. Uh, so many great, great uh, presenters on here, teachers. Uh, so many great topics coming up. Can't wait. So go ahead and check this out, tanzu.vmware.com, and check out the Golden Path to Spring 1. Uh, I mentioned my Spring Boot crash course. I mentioned that in uh, my newsletter this week. One other thing I had some fun with, I don't know if you saw us, Deshaun, but... Somebody did. Dan, I liked oh. your chat GBT video on the Spring Boot project. Great job. There we go. So we've we've been talking a lot. Well, at least I've been talking a lot about ChatGPT. I know I got you kind of involved in some things, doing some things with ChatGPT. We were talking about ChatGPT on the way here. All right. Yeah. So I did a little experiment where I kind of like said, okay, let's see if ChatGPT can build us a Spring Boot application. So it isn't like it isn't like you just feed it a line and say, build me an entire like to do app, right? It's not going to do that. But it does like it, I found it like really helpful in a in a few certain places. Like, hey, give me a list of steps on how to build like a Spring Boot application, like a REST API, and it would it would like lay out the like high level steps of what you should do, and then you could dive into each of those steps. Okay, write me the code for that particular step, and then we'll help you write that. So, again, I I think we've talked about this a number of times. I don't see it replacing any software developers anytime soon. Maybe in the long run, who knows? But you know, our job is not writing code. Our job is, you know, working with people on requirements and figuring out like what a project should look like. Um, so I thought like just having that as a, another tool in your toolbox as a developer is a is a pretty cool uh, option. So had some fun building that. Question from Simon: Chat GPT or comment Chat GPT and actuators is not the best combination from personal experiments. Uh, tell us more. I want to know what you're talking about. Yeah, I'd be interested. I wonder what that um, came from. Um, I think that's. I've used ChatGPT a lot actually with Spring Boot applications, especially for developing some apps for Tanzu application platform and different things that's like awesome. that. I've just used it to. I'm my background is not as a Spring developer. I actually most of my development was in has been in Go and JavaScript, and yeah. only recently have really been really diving into the spring world over the last year and a half or so. And it's really been extremely helpful for just, I copy paste the file and here, what's wrong in this file. Right. I mean, that's <laughs> what's wrong. And also, yep. hey, you know, you could actually make it better if you did this and this and this. I'm like, okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's another really great use case is like learning new things, right? Like if I want to learn Rust, I could write something in Java that I know how to write and say, okay, convert this to Rust. And then it, maybe it converts it to Rust. And then I could say, okay, 
I don't quite understand what you're doing with that code. Can you please explain to me? And it will sit there and explain line by line, like what is actually going on in that block of code. So, man, there are so many great use cases for it. I like Ted's take. Our job is writing tests. Let GPT write the code to make them fast. <laughs> I like it. I like it. They don't call you TDD Ted for nothing. <laughs> The setup itself goes fine, but some of the configuration security at times is iffy. Also, when you ask for the latest things, but that's somewhat related to its older data. It is. Yep. So it runs into like the end of 2021. So even with this one in, in this video I put together, I built a Spring Boot 3 application. It, did, it didn't know, like it had all the Java X, you know, namespaces in there instead of the Jakarta ones. So again, you need to understand this stuff. You're not just going to like say, hey, build me this app and deploy it to production, right? Like if, as long as you have a working understanding of something, I think it's a, a really great tool. Yeah, but there's still some, some rough edges. Uh, one of the things that we were chatting about over the weekend is it was just making things up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It sounded good, but yep. it was all made up. That was the yep. best one when I asked it to write me an automation for how to update a DNS record in AWS. And <laughs> it literally gave me a command like AWS, like the whole AWS CLI command, and you run it. And that command does not exist. It never existed. When I tried to figure out where it took it from, there was a recommendation in a GitHub issue requesting them to create this. And it just <laughs> pulled in that data from a GitHub issue of what someone wanted the syntax to look like. And it wow. gave me the command. That's awesome. That is interesting. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of an interesting question. Uh, and now I'm going to ask it in a slightly different way. Dan, has chat GPT fit into your daily workflow yet? Yeah, it has. Um, <clears throat> so I'll back up too. So ChatGPT is the kind of interface on top of the Open A Open AI's APIs, right? ChatGPT itself has been down a lot lately because it's been getting so much like uh, traffic to it. So I end up using the Open uh, AI API like Beta Playground. So I've used that a lot. I just signed up for ChatGPT Plus, so they have a version now where if you pay 20 bucks a month, you get like faster response times and you won't get that, hey, we're down type of thing. So I am using that now because I do use it a lot. Um, just a couple examples. One, uh, as Scott said, sometimes I even like look at code and go, what did I do wrong here? So something with like SQL that I don't write every day, I pasted in like a SQL script to like alter a table. And I was like, what the heck is wrong with this thing? And it told me, hey, you're missing a semicolon at the very end. And I was like, Wow, I am. So just little things like that, debugging issues, explaining blocks of code that I don't understand. So I may paste in a block of code and go, can you explain this to me? Um, when I'm learning something new, so I'm learning Rust now and it's like, hey, I know the equivalent of this in like JavaScript or Java, but I don't understand like this Rust idiom. Can you explain this to me? And so I think with those things, I think it's great to learn with. Um, and I think it's great to automate things. So that one example I was putting together, hey, I have these 10 fields. Can you write me a SQL script to set up a table for this? Great. What's really cool is it remembers what it just did. Now write me a Java record to uh, use as a data, data carrier for that class, right? Cool. Now write me a REST controller that provides CRUD functionality for that. Mm -hmm. So like these things that I know how to do, but like, I can automate and like just be more productive with instead of like doing these kind of repetitive tasks. I found it to be like very, very helpful with. I have also signed up for the paid service. Uh, <laughs> I'm also incorporating uh, ChatGPT into my daily uh, workflow. Uh, the things I use it for, I, I ask for help writing emails. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I ask for outlines. Sometimes I just to organize my thoughts. Yep. Uh, and one of the other use cases uh, around code is uh, I've talked a lot about these bash scripts and things that I'm not proud of that were written in other languages. I'm taking the other languages and I'm saying, how would I do this in Java? And I'm converting, I'm going backwards. So all these other yep. one-off things I'm converting, including a lot of the Python workloads, the Python ML and stuff that I, I was running on uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, yep. I'm asking 
and getting help from chat GPT on how to do that in Java. Yeah. So I mentioned, I, I didn't even think about that side of things. So I was specifically talking about code, but daily workflow. Yeah. There's like everything. So writing emails is a big thing. I use it to help me write my newsletter. Like, Hey, uh, summarize this particular thing. I am using it to write blog posts. Like I have this video that create that I created. I don't want to go through and like write a whole new blog post because this is something like I already built. Like take this transcript of this YouTube video and, and write a summary of it. Right. Um, I want to write this tweet about this one thing, like take this thing and turn it into a Twitter thread. Like, cause I don't want to do that. Um, emails, like how do you politely tell someone no in this scenario where, you know, I don't want to come off like being mean about it, but I, I need to say no here. Um, so yeah, there are just so many, so many use cases. I oh. hired uh, two video editors from Upwork last a couple weeks ago. And it was like, I was like, okay, this is like one thing I don't, I don't want to write a job description for this. So ChatGPT, can you write me a job description for a video editor that, you know, for YouTube and like these specific things, wrote out a really good description. I posted that on Upwork and, and found like two really good candidates. So just so many use cases. For, for this show, uh, do you mind, since you gave your screen open, do you mind going to our show? Go to springofficehours.io. Uh, after the show, uh, I have the show transcripted. And then I take the transcription from the show and I put it into ChatGPT, and that's what provides the summaries. Uh, so maybe go to episode 25, because uh, they're not always uh, current. Uh, and yeah, and the summaries, we should be able to click there and see our summary. There you go, in this episode. So if you're interested in, in going back, or there was an episode like, oh, you know what episode? I'm going to go watch that again. Uh, the summaries in this episode are generated with help from ChatGPT. That's awesome. Cool. So I use it for all of my emails now. Whenever I finish <laughs> a meeting, I write all my notes. I'm like, hey, write write a business email here, right? Like, write a summary. Email. Like, I like, okay, I, I write data. I don't do business talk. I yep. don't do all of that. Great. This is the data. Write an executive summary of this meeting, please. And it fills oh. everything out perfectly for me. So I just write it in plain human text and it changes that into business text that I can actually send out from my corporate yeah. email. Well, that's just right. a good point. Write, write this into an executive summary. Exactly. Like, that's just, it works amazing. So I wrote, I wrote all, I write all my newsletters in Notion. Notion has some AI functionality. I haven't looked yet. I'm sure it's mostly probably using some. Almost everything is using some type of open AI or Google AI underneath the hood. I could probably figure this out. But one thing you could do is come in here and like. Hey, improve this writing for me, or fix my spelling and grammar, or make longer, make shorter, change the tone. Like if I want to have a specific tone about it, uh, just so many things. Summarize. I use summarize for almost everything now. It's like here's a big block of text. Give me a quick summary about it. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, this is a good one. It's great to build Java docs. Oh, I haven't thought about great. that. It's a great idea, Eduardo. Yep. Thank you so much. That is that is a good idea. Cool. Um, so that's ChatGPT. Before we get into some questions, I wanted to bring up something because I saw this like a year ago. It was kind of like a draft, and now it's actually a JEP. Uh, it's still a JEP draft, but at least I, it's out there now. Um, <clears throat> this is a JEP draft for implicit classes and enhanced main methods. Um, so this is for the Java language, but as as you know, this will help Spring as well. Like as we're trying to get um, new users onto the Java platform or new users into Spring, this is going to help out a lot. Um, so if you want to, uh, we'll leave a link to this, but uh, I just want to quickly talk about what it is. So one of the things, the problems with getting started with Java is it can be a little bit verbose when you're brand new to the language, right? Like there's a lot of things going on in a Java application that if you're just trying to write your first application, um, it may be a little bit like too much to, to, to take on at once, right? So like we have this classic hello world example and we have you know this um, modifier here that says this is a public and then this is a class and this is the name of the class. And then just to like print something out to the council, we have this thing public static void main, like that's really long. And what, what is all this thing, the parts of that going on here? And we have this argument, which is an array of strings. Um, why are we taking that in? We're not even using this, right? Um, and then we have 
what is I just want a print line. What is system dot out? Why why have I not why am I not even importing that here? There's a lot of things going on there that if you're writing your first Java programs or even you know in the first couple months of learning Java, that can be a lot. So this JEP is to kindly strip some of that away so we can get down to just kind of a class, hello world, with a void main and say, print this out. Um, there are some things that are going on in there to make this happen, um, but you could even get down to something as simple as void main print this thing out to the council. Um, so I think this is really cool. I think this is gonna, this is really gonna help out. I, everything the Java language has been doing over the last eight years has really helped out the language. I think this is just another one of those things that are really gonna help us um, get new people into Java uh, as they're getting started with it. So have you guys seen this yet? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Simon said he saw it, and he was very, very happy to see it moving forward. Cool. Yeah, I had not seen this one yet, and this, from my perspective, is huge. Like, this would be so great for, especially now that Java is really catching on again with the introduction of GraalVM, right? There is now so many people moved away from Java because of the large memory consumption it had, which caused yep. people move to other applications and just large footprint for mm -hmm. certain use cases. And now we're seeing with Graal VM that we're seeing a large interest back in coming back and gaining the benefits that Java and Spring especially bring to us. And this will just make it easier for those new developers, which I think is huge. As someone who went through this process not long ago of becoming <laughs> a developer, yep. I would love to have had this a year and a half ago. Yep. Um, so before I tag onto that, I want to uh, remind everybody, uh, send an email with your address to stickers at springofficehours.io uh, and we will send you stickers, send, us, send you out some stickers anywhere in the world. I just need your address, stickers at springofficehours.io. Uh, the Grawl VM conversation, one of the other big topics that came out of this uh, technology forum here in Tel Aviv uh, was the migration uh, from Spring Boot 2 to Spring Boot 3. Uh, lots of customers are asking, lots of organizations are making this move. And then today on Twitter, uh, I saw that somebody had posted, hey, this is a great, great uh, upgrade. I only had to change one file, uh, add the Grawl VM processing, and hey, I just saved, uh, I think it was 5X or a fifth. Uh, I'm using a fifth of the, the memory that I was using before. Like just massive savings and that is a big part of the conversation that's happening right now uh, where a lot of workloads that maybe uh, maybe an organization has tons of spring expertise and they're looking for something that has a smaller footprint or a different performance profile now we're adding that the spring team has delivered that with the girl vm support uh, so yeah big part of the conversations that we're going on here that's great to hear, and I think um, I think that story is only going to continue this year uh, as we get you know if, if things shape up the way they're looking like in the JDK, if we get Project Loom later this year in JDK you know 21, and that goes into Spring Framework 6.1, we're going to have a whole new set of customers that are you know on those workloads that are you know high throughput, Spring MVC applications, talking to databases going to take advantage of Project Loom and virtual threads and, and see some huge performance gains there. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited about that, uh, what we have to look forward to later this year. And I love hearing those stories of people, you know, especially they, they decided to make the change, the make to, to update to Spring Boot 3 and Spring Framework 6.4 Graal VM, but then like, oh yeah, I was on Java 8 still and now i'm on java 17 and look at all the performance gains i got from that and security updates and uh, all the new language features which make developers happy so yeah it's been fun listening to those stories this year so far and yeah definitely more to come yeah no for sure it's amazing how almost anyone i talk to still has applications on java 8 it's like <laughs> as someone who's like so involved in the kubernetes world where it's like you have three months to upgrade your Kubernetes cluster. It's like every three months there's a new version. It's like, hold on a second. Like you're still in Java 8? How old is yep. that? Yep. It's like, it, that shows you how stable it is and how like, how really stable it is. It's amazing 
It's just such a, when you enter the world of telling, it's like, oh my God, that's how long this can last for. And All right. Then, yep. The process cool. isn't as, it, as you might think that it is. It's actually pretty easy for most cases. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's just some of these, you know, some of the big companies too, bigger, the bigger the company, the slower they move. So <laughs> mm -hmm. cool. Um, so we have some time for some questions. Um, so please go ahead. And if you have a chance, go ahead and ask your questions in there. I've got a bunch of questions in our mailbag still. Um, but yeah, you're here. You're here live. Uh, yeah. And we're, we're a bigger group. So we have even more power to answer your questions today. Uh, get your questions into chat. Uh, tell us hi. Let us know where you're, you're coming in from. Uh, otherwise, we've got, we've got a backlog. Yeah, so this one, I'm going to start for you. Um, this came from YouTube. Hi, what changes do I need to make for running Redis with Spring Boot 3.0? That is excellent. Redis has been also a big topic of conversation for me uh, the past couple of weeks. What changes do I need to make? None. Uh, the Our good friend Brian Samboden uh, is making a, a new release. I think there's a, a snapshot release available. Uh, I will put the URL into chat uh, where he's now providing the native support uh, for the Redis OM for Spring, which gives you all of the extended modules. Uh, support on top of Spring Data Redis. Uh, I actually passed that over to a customer uh, earlier this week and it got them unstuck. They were trying to use the Redis search and Redis JSON. Uh, so the, the community is massive. Uh, we have great integrations with Redis uh, through Spring Data Redis and through Redis's own Redis OM Spring library. So the required changes are zero. Uh, it's pretty much a straight upgrade. So all of my projects so far have been a straight upgrade when you get into the native support that you're probably trying to get with Spring Boot 3, uh, the only change is, yeah, reach out to the Redis OM Spring. Uh, if you're using those modules, that's where you'll get the native support. Great. Um, another question I had come in from Twitter. Hi, just a simple question. If I learn Spring Boot, do I need to learn Spring 2? What is the difference? Lastly, how can I get jobs in Spring? Thanks for the amazing work. So, um, yeah, two different things. You hear the you hear the Spring framework. You hear Spring Boot. What's the difference? Spring uh, framework is the foundation. This is kind of the core foundation for building Spring applications. Spring Boot adds some features on top of that. Um, things like auto configuration, Spring Boot starters, production ready features. Um, so yes, you. We'll start with Spring Boot. So you go to start.spring.io, create a new project. It helps you bootstrap a project. Uh, as you're building stuff, you're building stuff using Spring. Um, you're using the Spring Boot features, uh, but you're also using the, the foundation, the framework to build these things out. Um, lastly, how can you get a job in Spring Boot? Deshaun, what's your advice there? Use Spring Boot. <laughs> well, if you want to get better at something, yeah, use it more. Uh, finding a job, it's a massive ecosystem. There's, it feels like there's always jobs available. So yeah, just start using it. Yeah, and I think the main one really from my perspective is also like what I've been seeing a lot is solving like solve an actual issue with like the code, right? Like a lot of people try and like do these hello worlds and hello worlds are a great way to get started. But I think that like the real way to learn these things and then get the job is actually like create a real application that solves some issue. Now that issue may be ordering a pizza from Domino's, right? Like it doesn't matter, but like actually that does something, right? Not just like a mock demo or something. Mm -hmm. Do something that you can also get value from. And the way that I've always done it is find something that maybe bash is the right solution, right? For something of a simple to something you do repetitively that you want to automate or run that in spring, right? Whether it's the right programming language for that specific right. issue isn't what's at hand here. It's use the language. The way you learn is by solving something that's actually going to solve something for you. Cause then you're yeah. invested in it. And over time you can go back and make it better. When you learn more, you come back and you get better at it. If it's a hello world app, you're not going to go back to it in three months. That, that's like really great advice because it's a lot of time people will build stuff that they have no interest in either. Like, let me build a social media app in spring. 
but you don't use social media. Like you're not, <laughs> you have no investment in that then. Like, right. Build something in the domain of things that you're working on. Um, if you like to blog, yes, there are blogging platforms out there that you could go use for free and blog with, but Hey, build your own. Maybe you'll, have, you'll learn some things along the way of doing that. Um, build things that are relevant to what you're interested in. And I think that that learning goes a long way. And people watch a video, you know, they watch a video and, and just regurgitate what um, the author was doing on screen. It's like, okay, that's good to like learn the mechanics, but now take what you've done. And like Scott said, apply it to something else that solves like a real world problem for you. Um, I see we have some questions coming in here. How should non-devs get started with Java? Start dot spring dot io well that's spring i wish there was a start dot java .io. Nope. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm saying it here start dot spring dot io and it's kind of the same answer to the previous question do i need to learn spring if i'm trying to learn spring boot no you'll pick up spring and you'll pick up java at start dot spring dot io the documentation at spring.io is amazing. And that's where I recommend you start. I don't want you to go through the pain that we did. I, I understand survivor bias and, oh, I learned by doing this and Java doc was a thing, but you don't need to do that today. You don't have to go and learn everything. The abstractions keep on getting higher and that just makes your job easier. You don't, you're not required to learn all the way down to the bottom. Exactly. I I take like the perfect example of that is Kubernetes, right? Kelsey Hightower back in the day put out the uh, Kubernetes the hard way. I am one of those that actually followed that and generated the 17,000 certificates and created 17,000 files and somehow massed it all together after about seven days of banging my head against the wall, I got it to work. Um, but no, 90% of people, you run kind, mini cube, whatever, and you got a Kubernetes cluster on your local machine, you start. It's like... It doesn't, you don't need to start from the hard stuff. Start from the easy things or the easier things. Get rid of all of that just details underneath. Start with something easy. Once you understand that, then dive deep into it. But if you start from those raw levels, then start from assembly code, right? Like, because that's the base of Java. So let's start with assembly code or machine code. And like, we can only go so far down. You have to start with something that can resonate with you. Once you get that, then slowly go one step deeper. Then, yeah, start looking into the Java enhancement proposals. Start looking at Java core itself. Write an application without Spring after you've done stuff with Spring Boot. This is why I like Scott. This is, this yeah. is why. Uh, Great also, answer. Great answer. Ted's answer. Build stuff. Even better. Build stuff with others. Perry, Mob, mm -hmm. or watch the show. Watch Jitter Ted's show on Twitch. That's a great way to learn. Do stuff alongside of them. I've done a lot of them. Yeah, and that building stuff, you know, just as everybody's kind of echoed so far, is like the real learning is the failing. Like when you try to build something and you fail and you have to like use some resources to figure out like what is going wrong, debug the problem and, and solve it, that, that's where kind of the real learning comes in. So cool. Uh, another question here. Howdy, coming in from Columbus. Columbus, Ohio, you're like two hours away from me. That's awesome. Do you default to AOT, GraalVM for side projects? Can you share how you've approached choosing JIT versus AOT for deployments? Great question. Do you want to go first? That's all you. All right. This is in my wheelhouse. I do default to adding the GraalVM uh, dependency at start.spring.io uh, for development. I don't automatically assume that I'm going to deploy anything using AOT. So as I'm developing, I leave that option open. Uh, usually I get it done first with the just-in-time compiler, run it on the JVM. That's my inner loop development. Please don't use the AOT processing during inner loop development. Uh, and then once my application is run, right, I, I don't have money. Uh, you know, my, if I'm running it in the cloud, I want it to be as small as possible, as cost-effective as possible. So I do an analysis. So there's not a default uh, hey, this is definitely the way it's going to be. I don't default say, hey, I'm going to build this thing and it's going to be AOT. Uh, what I do is do the analysis. W can I make it cheaper? Can I make it more valuable by using the ahead of time processing? Otherwise, I'll do it the other way. 
Yeah, and I think some of this will come with repetition, right? This is kind of new for a lot of folks uh, getting into, you know, the Spring Boot 3 size and Grow VM. Um, the same way that if you're in a Java application and you need to choose a data structure, which data structure do I choose? You probably default to one, and then later on you go, oh, I actually need to, like, change that out because of performance reasons. So you'll start to get... Uh, you'll start to notice the patterns and the workloads that you're working with. If you're going to have an application that is going to be on all the time and have high throughput, the JIT is a great uh, solution for that. If you're doing something like serverless where it's going to you know, start up and just respond to something and then shut down and go away for a while, then um, you know, GraalVM and AOT is probably a good solution for that. I wish I had that uh, drawing, that graphic with me. I think we need... To we, have we need to, to like share that. Same thing. It's from Sebastian De La Use. Yep. Uh, we need to have that. I need to make that available. It needs we to should. Be. Um. I want to like clean that up too and put it in like Excalibur and like add some stuff to it. But it's a. It's just a really good representation of looking at it, going, okay, which workload uh, am I using? This is the path that I should go. So, and then some of them were assess. Like, hey, you might be doing something that's good for that, but like you said, this is this is a time to assess that. So. Uh, Spring Boot, and what's better, Java or Kotlin? We've I'm always... a Java person. I'm not a Kotlin. I haven't, I've never used Kotlin, so I, I've still, you know, I've asked our, our good friend Mario about this, like, please explain to me why I should be using Kotlin, and I just have not gotten a good answer yet, and I'm old, so I'm not going to be learning anything new unless it's called Rust, so I stick with Java right now. <laughs> I also, there's, there's so many things for me to learn right now. Uh, <laughs> taken the step to to learn kotlin so i'm i'm still defaulting to java as well yeah. never written a line in kotlin like nope <laughs> java but i will say it is by uh the folks at jetbrains who make my favorite id in the world so they are doing something right so maybe i do need to look at it mm -hmm. um What's been y'all's experience with hosting Spring applications on small footprint devices like Raspberry Pis? I know Spring Native exists to facil facilitate this, but what's the real world experience like? Real world experience? I I have 92 Raspberry Pis that are running. All of them have ran, well, no, not all, all the 64-bit ones have ran Spring as natively processed on ARM. Uh, the process is painless. Uh, I also provide the ARM64 build pack. If you're deploying images, uh, OCI images to those devices, uh, it works. Uh, we do have customers that are running Raspberry Pi devices with ARM64 native images of Spring Boot workloads. Uh, so it is a thing. Uh, and you probably know that Raspberry Pi now has commercial support for their devices. So this is, it's 2023. And you're going to see a lot more of native spring on ARM64 devices like Raspberry Pi. Awesome. Thanks for the question, Christopher from North Carolina. Uh, hello. Could you tell me the best way to learn cloud programming without paying AWS or Azure services? Yeah, I have. But there's a free tier that every cloud or you know, most clouds, I'll say, uh, provide a free tier for specifically that reason. They want you to be able to go and try out their services. They don't want you to uh, run up a bill. They want you to get excited about it. So the smart way of doing it is to not leave things running. The idea behind all of the clouds, it's not that a cloud is cheaper by any means, is that that cloud can be spun up and spun down as you need it. So while you're studying, while you're learning, stand up your cloud resources and don't be afraid. There's there's plenty, unless you're planning on uh, doing development for a hundred hours a day for a hundred different instances, yet yeah, your, your scale is going to be much lower than what the cloud can scale. Just clean up behind yourself when you're done. Yeah. I think it's also like, even there was a great announcement from Microsoft on this, that they just announced that they're going to be offering AKS free tier for the control plane, right? Where now the control plane isn't going to cost money for a free tier where you don't get resiliency, right? There's no SLA on that control plane, but for development, that's perfectly fine. It's like the other thing that I think is key is everyone thinks like, oh, I need to learn AWS or, oh, I need to learn Google or I need to learn Azure. 
in the end, once you learn one public cloud, transferring that knowledge to another is very simple because the concepts in the end are generally the same. So find the cloud that you can work in that's the most comfortable for you, that gives the best free tier for what you're doing. If you're doing Kubernetes, Azure is great for that. If you're just looking for VMs, AWS offers the best free tier for that. If you're looking for big data and you're looking at AI things, Google has the best free tier, right? Look at what there is, find the right cloud for you for that free tier, and then just play with it. Great stuff. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, if you are not on the free tier, I think one of the first things you should learn in any cloud is how to set those billing defaults. So, hey, when I get over $5, send me an email, notify me by text message, wave the alarm. Yeah. Sound like, the alarms and let me know that I spent more than five dollars. Because <laughs> if you don't do that, you could you could spend some money real quick. So make sure you learn how to do that on every platform. If you don't do that, you'll be me and get a seven thousand dollar bill from AWS because you forgot to turn off six. Oh no! <laughs> oh geez. <laughs> Oops. That's tough. Yep. We've all been there. Exactly. Yep. Well, you uh, we, learn from the mistakes. I, I've been there. I don't know that I've been $7,000 there. <laughs> uh, from Thomas, you're missing out on not using Kotlin. Every time I write Java at work, I scream because I miss it so much. Josh showed Manifold this week, uh, which seems to solve some of Java issues. So I would have to see what you're talking about because back in the day, I used Groovy for this reason. I was a big Groovy fan, still love Groovy. Uh, it's inside of great old scripts. Big fan of Groovy. I used it for that reason. Like I was more productive in Groovy. Eventually, Java caught up. Um, Java these days is not the same Java it was 10 years ago. So uh, I stopped using Groovy because Java, I don't write anything in Java that I go, wow, this is like terrible. Um, it used to be like that. Um, but with, you know, a lot of the advancements in the language, uh, you know, things like text blocks and records, uh, there's a whole bunch of great things in the language. So I'd be curious to know what is is great and i'm not i'm not saying that it isn't i'm just curious to know like what makes it so great um so and i heard and, data classes and but that, uh, java has records now so yep thomas uh so a little bit behind the scenes uh i don't know if it was last week or the week before uh thomas had some questions he wanted us to look at some code i asked him to send it to me and, and i did get it so thomas i did get it i have not nice. had a chance to look at it yet uh but i do have your project this is, we are here at your service. I want you to be unblocked. I have, I get so much joy <laughs> when I hear that you have been unblocked. That is the thing that, that's why we're here. That's why I love this job is when I can, I can help somebody, anybody in the community, uh, anybody that's especially that's coming in and asking questions during our, our office hours. You are priority, high priority as far as I'm concerned. So Thomas, I, I haven't gotten a chance to take a look at it, but I promise I will take a look at your project. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah, and I get it. If you're running Java 8 and then you can switch to Kotlin at home, okay, that makes sense. But if you're up to date on Java, it's a pretty nice language. So um, Leaves an EC2 instance running, sleep on the <laughs> <laughs> I, I have seen that meme, yes. <laughs> That's um, an automation now on my own, like personal AWS account that every night shuts off all the VMs, scales all my auto scaling groups down to zero. Mm -hmm. If I decide the next day to turn it back on, then I turn it back on. And I even set it where I can have a tag that if it has a tag, it doesn't power it off. Right. Like, so I can add something saying, hey, like, yeah, this I do need to keep running. I'm going to put a tag on that. But everything else, <laughs> shut it down like automatically. And that saves a lot of time and money. Cool. Um, another question I had that I saw somebody mentioned Spring Academy in here. I had a question come in and it was around Spring Academy. It said, um, would, you under, would you consider making a video about Spring and Spring Boot certifications? If I understand correctly, the only official certification is from VMware but the accessibility requirements and costs are rather unclear. Any insight you could, provi uh, could provide would be greatly appreciated. Thanks and have a great day, Giovanni. 
So I will say that in the past, yeah, uh, it's probably cost a little bit. Um, it could be out of some people's range to get a certification, but that is no longer the case. If you head over to spring.academy, this is a new um, service from VMware. There's a free tier where you can kind of get um, on-demand access to expert spring training. But there's also a pro, which is $2.99 for a year. And you also get a spring certified professional exam voucher. So for $2.99, you get all the pro courses, courses to learn what you need to learn. And then you can take for the certification. Year. Yeah, for a year. And so then you can I take the spring. The training, I get a year's worth of training, a year's worth of training, and pay for the test. Yep. Yep. So cool. That sounds like a pretty good deal. Um, okay. I can't see my screen anymore. Oh, because I, I popped That's up why. your. All right. No, 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 no. You're good. I just did. I, I didn't want to get into the inception world of screen inside a screen inside a screen. So yeah, we did the first time. Um, cool. Um, so that is that, uh, any other questions in here? Um, hello, are you planning to release more advanced tutorials and guides for spring authorization server with spring gateway and other spring microservices and some kind of JS friend? So yeah, so this is something we've been getting asked a lot. Um, we are working on some things for this. Uh, I would say uh, check out the Golden Path to Spring One. I know Thomas is going to be talking about uh, Spring Cloud Gateway next week or on mm -hmm. Thursday. Uh, check out the videos that were released for the Spring One Essentials. Uh, there are a couple on Spring Authorization Server there. Um, but yeah, those are some things in the backlog and some things we want to talk more about on this show is Spring Authorization Server. Great product. Um, and yeah, if you combine it with something like Spring Spring Gateway um, to cover up your mic, you know, in front of your microservices. Um, you're, you're hitting all the right buzzwords there. So, yes, we need to do something on that. Stefan, I am also working on a reference implementation. Uh, be on the lookout for Barbecue Wednesday uh, that'll have this kind of reference implementation of a pattern that we've talked about a lot here on the show. Cool. Um, we got another one. Do you know how I can pass a source sets configuration from my build.gradle.kts in my library to my application build.gradle.kts automatically? I do not know the answer to that. Nope, I do not know the answer. <laughs> All right. Um, sorry about that, Thomas. Spring Cloud Gateway versus Ingress. Hmm. What, what do you mean? Uh, For Kubernetes. Yeah. So I will deploy my Spring Cloud Gateway. And now, now there's the new uh, Gateway. Yeah, there's a new Gateway API as well, which that is really, I if, if it was uh, between Spring Cloud Gateway and Ingress, which I don't think it necessarily is because we can deploy Spring Cloud Gateway behind an Ingress, mm -hmm. which is actually what I typically do. Same. Um, but... Even if it was one against the other, that fight is very, or that you know, debate is really changing now with Gateway API, where what we're seeing is like the version two of services and ingress coming together, where a lot of that functionality from Spring Cloud Gateway is now becoming Kubernetes native. Um, so it's like it's now becoming a much more almost fair comparison where before, what was ingress? Hey this is the path, go to this microservice. If it's this path, go to this microservice. That was basically it. Now we're actually getting a lot of layer seven and routing capabilities. Spring Cloud Gateway is still much more of an API gateway than it is just a layer seven load balancer. And I think we often mix those terms together of an API gateway and a layer seven load balancer, and they're not the same thing. Like the integration with SSO and doing authorization and all of that, Gateway API and Ingress, that is out of their scope. Like they can maybe call out to an exit, but like there's so much more we can do with Spring Cloud Gateway. Um, and it really comes down to the general thing in the Kubernetes world of 
where is that line between developer and operator, right? In the end, there is a line somewhere between platform and developer. Where it is, I don't think we've come as an industry yet to the correct, to the definitive answer. Whether we will or not is also another question or every company will be different. But if it's on the developer side, Spring Cloud Gateway. If it's on the operations side, maybe it's Gateway API or Ingress more so because that's more in their, you know, realm of things they feel comfortable with. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, good. Um, Dan, will we ever see a new view tutorial on your channel? I really like learning front ends from a back end perspective. So uh, it'll help a lot to see you do it. That's a great question. And I got another similar question, so I'll, I'll answer that along the same lines. Um, uh, I would like to ask which front-end framework is best for rapid prototyping? I don't have much time or resources, so I'm looking for something quick and easy to use. So again, into the front-end world, you know, what are the kind of best resources to get up and running? And again, this this really depends on you know wh what you're interested in. If if you're interested in like what is the most popular one out there, um, Angular and, and React or React is probably the most popular front-end framework out there right now. Angular is really big in in enterprises. Vue I like just because it's simple for me. It's uh, there's some, there's a real nice simplicity to it. There is a there is a build tool out there now called Vite. So Vite was was built by the creators of Vue, but it's now framework agnostic. So it allows you to build a React app, a vanilla JavaScript app, a Svelte app, a Vue app, whatever. And it's so much faster than like Webpack is, and it, it, it it's just a really easy tool to get up and running with some of these front end frameworks. So I would check out Vite. I'm a big fan of Vue. If you're in the Vue world, I'm a big fan of Nuxt. Nuxt three just came out uh, end of last year, which is a really great framework for building applications. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, I'm going to be doing some more. I'm actually going to be rewriting my site, which is in another framework now in Nuxt three. Uh, so we'll kind of I'll, have, I'll put together some tutorials around that as I start to build that out, and I will be using um, Vue and Nuxt in a in in a course coming up. So yes. So what I just heard is when you're wanting to learn something new, you build something that you care about. Yep. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, yep. Sure. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I uh, GitHub Copilot at all? I have so. Funny enough, so GitHub Copilot actually uses OpenAI's codex underneath the hood, which is what Chat GPT is using. You right. won't always get the same answers because the way that the, uh, the 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 knobs underneath the hood are kind of like tweaked, you'll get kind of different answers. But yeah, GitHub Copilot's been great. I I I you know what I find? I, I think it. I don't know how this works yet because I haven't really dove in there. But like, if I write like a demo and I and I work on the demo first locally to like figure out what I'm going to build, and then I'm recording a video to like do that demo, it remembers a lot of the stuff that I was doing. So like, I'll go to like type out like a class with like ten properties, and it goes, "I've seen you do that before. I'm going to help you write that," and it does. And it's just like, wow, this is like really good at this. So yeah. yes, I, I'm a big fan of Copilot. I use it in VS Code and I use it in java and spring uh within intellij so yeah no that's how i started with front end like i wasn't front end at all and right. that's how i learned like front end i like okay learned the yep. general i knew node and then yep. e and i was writing a react app and it just yay like it was like so easy it like yeah. auto did things for me yeah um, that's a great point so so yeah if you're new if you're new to front end stuff and you're a back end developer try github copa Try ChatGPT. Hey, ChatGPT, I need to write a login form, and hey, use this thing called Tailwind CSS to like style it up. I mean, that'll spit out exact pretty much what you need, and then yep. you have a starting point. Uh, so yeah, it's a great re those are great resources for being more productive as a, a front end developer for for those of us who enjoy back end development. I got a little jealous of you talking about all the front end work, uh, and I have been digging into Vaden. Uh, which mm -hmm. is related here. Uh, what do you guys think about Hilla? Seems like a non-brainer when developing a spa, a single page application with Spring Boot. Uh, and yeah, Hilla comes from the same people that have given us Vaadin. And uh, I'm, I'm deep in it and I love it. Cool. So 
Vaadin has something very similar to start.spring.io. They've yep. got start.vaadin.com. And there you can actually set up, they have examples. So in your application, you can develop it uh, from there. You can actually generate a Git repository from start.vaadin.com. And you can have it plug in some examples, like a login page out of the box. So yeah, I'm a fan. Cool. All right. We're getting up against it here, but let's just try and answer a couple more. Um, is session auth possible for RESTful applications? Yes. <laughs> that was very dramatic. I like it. Yes. I think that's all you need. Currently, I'm using Apache POI, uh, a lot of process Excel files, a lot to spring batch support Excel, um, Excel SX to XSSD. So I don't know I don't know the like exactly what it supports, but um, you know batch yeah anytime you're doing large conver large data sets of conversion, um, I would reach for batch for that. So I don't know exactly in that scenario if it supports that, but it sounds like a great use case for it. Yeah, Spring Batch doesn't do anything for your Excel data sets out of the box. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're using Poi to do that, uh, you can use Poi and Spring Batch in combination right. uh, with something like Spring Cloud Dataflow, uh, check back a few episodes, uh, and that could absolutely be a workflow that you could do. Yep. I need a bit of help getting session-based auth for my RESTful applications. Can I DM GitHub links or tweets? Yes, so anytime yes. you can provide us with uh, some source code that we could take a look at, uh, much easier than having to recreate the situation. So, yes, reach out to us um, uh, at the real Dan Vega at Deshaun on Twitter. Uh, please go ahead and send that over. And then, if we get a chance to go through that and find out, you know, what was going on, uh, we can share that uh, on next week's show. So, I think TimeLeaf with HTMX is the fastest way to build web web applications with Spring. HTMX is awesome, so if you haven't heard of that, check that out. Um, currently building a TimeLeaf view component library to make experience and testing better. And not sure if you've done it already, can you please demo a small cloud native end-to-end -end Spring Boot app on Kafka, Hashi, Docker, Redis to make it truly cloud native? Um, I'm just curious, like what? Yeah, what are what what's the combination of those things do making it truly cloud native for you? Um, uh, they're they're I think they're looking for a cloud native app that has these capabilities in it. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for showing up. Time leaf and HTMX equals if check. It's got a checkbox Done. from Gitter Ted, then it's definitely <laughs> something. Uh, I, I will definitely throw my own checkbox behind it because Jitter Ted. <laughs> cool. I think that's all questions. Um, we this made it. Good. Yeah. It's like it's like almost midnight there, isn't it? Uh, I need to sleep. Midnight. It is almost midnight. <laughs> what uh, what's your plan? Uh, is there is there more events tomorrow? Or are you guys done? What's happening? I'm meeting with customers tomorrow. Uh, I'm gonna do a little uh, sightseeing tomorrow. Nice. Uh, I think that's the entire plan. That's that's all. That's everything that I'm doing tomorrow. Uh, do a little sightseeing, right. uh, prepare for a customer meeting, and then go and hang out with customers. And when do you get to return back to the lovely home of yes. KC? Where Kansas City Developer Conference is in Kansas City. Yeah. Uh, and it's right around the corner. Uh, I will be heading back to Kansas City on Thursday. Awesome. And if you'd like to see me in Kansas City in June, please reach out to all the people who are on the committee at KCDC and bug them. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, cool. Well, that was fun. We will get uh, next week's show set up. Deshaun, will you be home for this? Or are you going to be on vacation some more? I will be home for next week's show. All right. And all right. I think I'm going to really, really push for next week for us to do two shows. Oh, because right now I'm over in Israel and, you know, last week we didn't do it at a regular time. Uh, we got a lot of great response. We saw a lot of people from a lot of different places. Uh, yep. And even the people that are watching it afterwards, they seem to like the recording being done later. So it's it's working out. And I think I'm going to push for two shows next week. So everybody stay tuned. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> 
As far as sharing a GitHub link, do you want us to PM or tweet? Uh, doesn't matter. Either or. My DMs are open. Yep. Cool. Well, that was fun. Scott, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to answer some questions. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was great to be here. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, I think with that, we'll end it. You guys have a good rest of your night there. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we will see you next week. Thanks, everybody.